it's it's Comics Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, at, at the on the corner of Fifth and Williams. Uh, Fifth and William. I always mix that up for some oh. reason. But it's comics.aedl.org is the website where you can find about find out about all the awesome comics events going on in the Ann Arbor area, including uh, the updates on this very live web show, web series, web video thing, video film. Uh, Have you done this before? <laughs> <laughs> Is this your first broadcast? I, I think you're intimidating him, Mark. I think that's oh, the problem. It He's was, all like, oh, it's Mark Wade. Yes, it was Mark Wade. He who turns was, into who Mary speaking. Tyler Moore. <laughs> 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 so we got Mark Wade on the show. Uh, I'm Jersey Droz. Not that anybody needs to know that. But Mark Wade is here of uh, thrillbent.com and markwade.com. And also flying co-pilot on this one is uh, Paul Story. Thanks. I think, I think that's his name. Yeah, of Storyville. Storyville. Dot com. Storyville on Twitter, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. We'll, we'll buy- I wasn't sure you were going, but okay. we were, we're going to bypass the extended intro for you because you've sure. been on the show a whole bunch of times. We want to talk about Mark real quick. Uh, Mark Wade, gosh, what haven't you done uh, in comics? Let's see. Uh, Irredeemable, Flash, JLA, He's 52. never been a custodian for comics. Were you never a custodian? I don't think he ever worked as a... I was a librarian. I worked. I was in charge of the DC library. Does that count? Dude, I've done everything but put the staples in the books. I mean, yes. I re- I've, I've colored, I've published, I've lettered, I've done production work, I've, I've, you know, done a little bit of art here and there. Not that anybody needs to see it, but yeah, it's I've I've been around. It's you know, if I ever have to find a real job, I'm screwed because I have no applicable <laughs> talents. But so far, so good. Well, you're learning the photoshops now, though, so you should. That's be, exactly you, know, like... you kids and your photoshops. <laughs> That's always the way, is to put an S. Thank you, George W. Bush, for giving us that one. Right. Uh, put an S after something that makes you sound old. Or, but, or the. The. Well, the. the Photoshop. Noun. S. Yeah. Old. That, that's the equation, everybody. Uh, so, but, you know but what? But Mark is eternally young. Mark is eternally yeah. young. The, the man loves comics. The man loves comics a lot. Uh, although some people debate that point sometimes, as we'll talk about in a little bit. <laughs> but uh, but you, you launched this thing, this thing called Thrill Bent. And I want to try to frame this real quick. I'm going to try to like put this in a package so we can have, uh, form a vector of approach into talking about what Thrill Bent is and what it does and why you're doing it. Um, you know, when I, when I read the news about you talk, uh, breaking the news about uh, Thrill Bent and the responses people had to it, it made me think of an analogy of it's like the being at Thanksgiving dinner and Mark Wade was the guy who uttered the family secret and everybody went no 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 you just don't say that you know you don't talk about Billy he's just that way you know <laughs> Mark Mark came out as being digital <laughs> he and, came out. and and you know to to a lot of people as Mark you know in web comics like yeah you know dude we've been doing web comics for a long time uh, but but uh, for some reason this was a shocking thing for the the you know the traditional comics industry was that you're doing digital comics now and 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 you you bankrolled this thing by selling your beloved comics collection which I'm sure was no uh, tiny it thing. Was no easy no. task. Yeah. And yeah. there's still long, lonely nights when I lie in bed and weep, you know, wistfully for my world's finest collection, but we make do. Well, isn't it true, though, Mark, that you've got them all reco- recorded in your brain? I have exactly. Been, I have I, been it, at it, shows where oh, you go, wait, I'm going to go oh. read Superman 61. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, see, it's it's all there. It's It's like digital in his brain. It is. It really is. Now ask me my senator's name. I don't. Know. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, so I'm I'm just wondering, you know, because like this is something that, that when I put out the call on Google Plus, like, hey, what are you guys interested in, in having us discuss on the show as we talk about Thrillbent.com? Uh, people were saying like I wanted to know what Mark's reaction or or how Mark dealt with the the negative impact because some uh, we I, we don't have to name names but the names are out there some retailers immediately banned your works from their stores because you were single handedly somehow killing the entire traditional industry by making this move I know not to name names Coliseum of Comics in Orlando Florida I'll give you the address later um, no not to name names but there were there were retailers who were upset and and felt as if I were somehow turning my back on brick and mortar stores. That's not the case, and I take full responsibility for that misunderstanding. I, you know, the, the problem is that I didn't do a good enough job early on of shaping the conversation as print and digital instead of print versus digital. Uh, part of that is because when I came out of the gate, I was uh, talking about this stuff about two years ago. I was a little more uh, foaming at the mouth at how the industry's uh, fortunes were seemed to be on the wane, whereas they seemed to have stabilized a little bit over the last 
couple of years old. That doesn't help us, but we'll get back to that in a second. Um, overall, I, the reaction has been very positive. I did a piece for NPR just last week, and I, it's a typical experience. I went into a comic store as part of the interview, and we talked with the guy who ran the store, and he and I never really spoken before. And so he just assumed I was coming into the store with a torch in one hand and a bottle of napalm in the other. And I explained to him, I, it's not, I love comic stores. I've spent more time in comic stores than I have in church. I, I really want there to continue to be brick and mortar comic stores. The, the problem that I'm running into is that unless you're one of Diamond's premier publishers, in other words, unless you're one of the top five or six publishers in comics and you get sort of favorable discounts and favorable treatments from the distributors because you're most of their market share, uh, most of the other publishers who are working are having a really hard time, and I don't see that getting any better because print costs continue to escalate. That's something that's you know, above and apart from the comics industry in general. It's just print costs, whether it's books, newspapers, magazines, comics, they just continue to escalate. That's the law of supply and demand. And we are long past a point at which, say, I would feel comfortable launching a yeah, you know, a, a non superhero book by myself and someone else into the comics market and hope to not lose my shirt. Um, it's 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 a very difficult time. There are certain outliers that work. Saga for Brian Vaughn is coming in at high numbers. Uh, Walking Dead obviously has a, a great track record, um, and it can be done. But those are outliers, and those are. You know, there doesn't seem to be very much uh, faith on my part or, or, or the part of the marketplace that those things can survive and thrive. Um, so digital made sense to me as a way to produce material that is not necessarily welcome in comic or not necessarily accepted by comic shops across the nation on a regular basis and do it in such a way where I can cover my costs digitally and then hopefully go to print once I might cost are covered. And if there's still enough comic stores out there that I haven't pissed off uh, who are willing to carry trade paperbacks, then great. I give them something to sell too. So it's a win-win. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a model that's been explored by other uh, successful web sure. cartoonists, right? You're like guys like Scott Kurtz, guys like R. Stevens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not inventing anything here. No, no, really no. Yeah, and, I'm just going to be consolidating a bunch of people's philosophies and stuff. Yeah, right, right. And, that, and that, but that was the part that really surprised me was that there was such an outcry from some areas of the traditional uh, I, industry. But but I think partly because Mark is sort of uh, uh, you know considered to be one of the big names in you know mainstream print comics, um, and and you know your your longtime love of the medium and uh, it's it, and the you know, superheroes in particular, uh, I think, you know, made people kind of think, well, he's, uh, you know, a Marvel DC guy, or even if when you went to Boom, you you still did a couple of superhero-related things. So people are like, oh, well, this is, you know, we are his people. Right. As if there's a distinction between comics people who read online versus comics people who read print. Well, yeah, and that's something that actually I do a callback to an old Comics Are Great episode, Comics Are Great episode 50, where I was talking with Dave Roman and Casey Van Heis and um, Tony Cliff and Brandon Dayton about this this weird cultural divide between there's the traditional industry and everybody else. Yeah. And it's so weird. And, you know, and then one guy comes along and says, well, can it, can it be both? And, you know, <laughs> it's, it reminds me of that Douglas Adams line about, like, uh, I forget what it was, like 2,000 years after some guy came along and said, wouldn't it be nice if we all were just nice, nice to, to each, each other? other? And they and nailed him to a tree for his point. trouble. <laughs> 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 not, to, not to compare you to Christ. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, there, uh, what I have found in the last two or three months as I spend a lot more time talking to web cartoonists talking to guys who have been really successful at what they do, the blind ferret guys who do, you know, uh, hijinks and Sue and the gutters and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Scott Kurtz, of course, PVP, the Alex DeCampia Valentine, you know, Brian Clevenger and atomic robo. There's a, a lot of these guys are, it's one of the comics best kept secrets. The good web comics guys are actually making a decent living doing this. Nobody's getting rich. Nobody's driving around in Rolls Royces, but they're making a decent living and they're able to do what they want to do. And they're working on products that are completely there and ideas that are completely theirs. 
I want to say also, uh, here's another callback to la- the last episode. This is kind of like a follow-up almost in a way to the discussion we had last week with Eli Nyberger and Josh Elder where we were talking a lot about this notion of the future of digital licensing for comics. We were talking about Josh Elder has this this, this uh, project where he's going to be uh, licensing comics collections to libraries so that patrons yeah. can check out comics in libraries. And, you know, one of the things that we've talked about a lot on this show is that, you know, it may be that we have to confront this idea that there's no money in making the comics themselves and you have to find other means to it's not it's not the thing that you're buying. It's the stuff surrounding the thing that you're making uh, is is something that we have to really consider. Which which is, I think, what uh, almost got Mark punched out two years ago at the Harvey Awards. (laughs) Oh, I forgot about that. Something basically like that. Yeah. Let's hear Let's hear the story because this is a good one. Yeah. Sorry, Mark. I didn't mean to actually (laughs) put you on. I I got up at the Harvey Awards a couple of years ago, did a keynote speech that was perhaps not as well rehearsed and slick as I would like it to have been in retrospect. Um, <laughs> I, I got, but basically the gist of it was getting up there and talking about how the model has changed. I talked about everything. I, talk, I think I talked for an hour and a half and I talked for about everything under the sun. And one of the points that I hit that seemed to really strike the heart, the, the sharpest nerve in the room was that it, it may not be all about, the business model that we've been working under all these time, all these years, it's, it's time to embrace a bunch of new business models, not the least of which is figuring out ways to work with torrents and, and quote unquote pirating because you can't stop it. So how do you figure out a way to make that work for you? That didn't go over well. The notion, as Paul hit upon a second ago, that the job is morphing a little bit where you might not be able to make the living that you were used to making if you were just sitting behind a keyboard and there may need to be a little bit of an adaptation on your part in terms of marketing, in terms of selling yourself. Um, the, what we're into, what we're entering into and what the web comics guys have known for a long time and what incredibly talented people like Louis CK and Aziz Ansara are learning as well is that the distribution models in place now that PayPal exists on most computers and smartphones, and now that uh, you know the social media has made it so easy for fans to connect with each other, is that that's your fan base there. There's your distribution base, and you don't necessarily have to distribute your creative wares through HBO or Disney or DC Comics or Marvel Comics. Uh, if you want to, if you're willing to put the sweat equity into it, you can create a fan base. You can, if your work's any good, and if you get a, you know, and if there's enough people out there responding to what you're doing, you create a fan base. You nurture that fan base. You get them excited and worked up about what you're doing. You make them feel not like part of the process exactly, but you make them feel like part of, you know, a, an audience that they're that they're being listened to, uh, and they're not just being ignored, and you're not just taking their money and running. And they will, in turn, become the base by which you can sell your your wares. And they'll buy your comics, but they'll also buy your T-shirts, and they'll also buy your, you know, your original art. They'll buy your scripts. They'll buy whatever they feel like buying. I mean, I, whatever they can do to show their support, they're interested in doing that. So the the upside to that is that it's a whole new way of marketing your work, and it's a way of connecting with your audience, and it's a way of building an audience that – you can count on on a month-to-month basis and not have to give a big part of the store away to your distributor or to your publisher. The downside to it is that not everybody's built for that. I mean, it, it's a pain in the ass. I, you know, to have to, if you're used to making your living doing nothing but being the iconoclast behind the keyboard and doing your scripts, well, you know, if you're an older creator, you might have to learn how to use Facebook and Twitter. You might be well advised to learn how to do podcasts or how to, you know, work a Skype account like we're doing right now so you can do interviews and get out there. You might want to hit more conventions with some of your actual merchandise based on your stuff. Uh, It's you're sort of diversifying how you were making a profit before. Uh, It's a little more work. It's a little more effort. And not everybody's built for it. Um, But and that's one of the notes I hit during the Harvey Awards that I think really struck a nerve that there's a lot of next gen or a previous generation artists and writers out there who sort of felt like what is this kid talking about you know he's this, he's speaking heresy you know i i you know burn him <laughs> i was going to say after uh what uh cuz she started very young boy editor yeah. at 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 dc and have having been in the industry as long as you have does it 
feel kind of weird when people still go like, what is this young Turk talking about? <laughs> no, I'm, you know what? I, that's actually what hung me up at the Harvey Awards. And I, Paul, you and I talked about this, yep. that I, I got up there because I'm a pretty decent extemporaneous speaker and I had my notes ready for my speech, but at the same time, I didn't have like a, a finely honed speech ready to give because I'm pretty relaxed in crowds like that until I get up there and suddenly I'm looking down and there's Walt Simonson looking back at me <laughs> and you know, Denny O'Neill and Bernie Wrightson, and they're all looking at me like, so what do you got to say, kid? And I just then, you know, feathers came out of my mouth I, like a cartoon. I had and, that same experience last year Yeah, when I was presenting the uh, Writer's Award. Yeah, so, oh. yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine still being the kid to some of these guys. I still feel that way. I don't care how old I get. I will always think of the, the guys whose work I read growing up as the adults in the room. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 the same way. I, I I got carded, or no, I didn't get carded when I was buying alcohol a few weeks ago, and they said, "Dude, I saw your hair. It's no problem." It was some oh. smarmy twenty something, <laughs> and and it really, I mean, it wasn't that I was insulted. I was just so caught off guard, like, "Oh yeah, that's right," because my my inner the, the my my inner picture is still like an eight year old kid. So yeah. when I, go I to, it's 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 the uh, what they call the residual image from the Matrix where. Yeah, you know, it's like Keanu. Oh yeah, yeah, it's that everything. kind of deal. Yeah, yeah, I run into that all the time. Okay, but. but um, but I want to get it. Yep. You want to dive at something somebody threw in the chat. Uh, Jamie Gamble is in the chat of jamiegamble.com, and he says that you know we need to get back to like we often forget that comics were once a disposable medium, right? Yeah. It was a disposable throwaway thing, and yeah, it became a collector's thing later, but it wasn't originally meant to be that, right? It was right. part of an overall intellectual property thing, right? Well, and yeah, I mean, it was it was just uh, it's sort of like on websites now. It was content. It was you know especially they started off as mostly in the newspapers, it was just a way to, you know, fill fill the newspaper with something that would catch people's eye. And, yeah, and, and, and so you make it as disposable as possible, and the web is very, very disposable. Okay, so we got, like, the, the idea behind what you're doing. I want to talk about, like, the specifics of what you're doing that I think is really interesting. First of all, are people getting paid to do these books? Not. <laughs> people are getting paid to do these books because I sold my comics collection. The uh, heck you yeah. say? Since when do cartoonists get paid for a book before it comes out in print? That is nonsense. I don't believe I know. You. That's crazy talk, <laughs> crazy isn't talk. it? It's, yeah. But welcome to the 21st century, my friend. And um, by the way, th Mark, thanks for keeping Pete Krause busy because his oh, stuff's so great. Pete's amazing. I, yeah. I, that's the thing. I, I'm, I'm smart enough to work with people who make me look good. That's, that's my number one goal. Um, the... We are still, you know, here's the thing. Had I, had I tried to work out every last little bit of the system down to its perfect degree before I launched the site, it would be 2015 before we got up there. I mean, that's kind of, I've actually been ready to go up and, and run with some of this material for months and months, but I kept putting it off with, a, with an idea of, you know, I still need to learn a little bit more about monetization or no, I still need to explore a little bit more about this technical aspect or that technical aspect. Yeah. And it was and it was my partner, John Rogers, who uh, is my my business partner on this venture, uh, who pushed me into it a couple of months ago and just said, look, why don't you take that minus into a plus? Why don't you take the fact that you're still learning this stuff and turn the sister blog and markwade.com, turn that into a process blog? in which I can be transparent about what I'm learning, how I'm putting this together, the lessons I'm, I'm learning, the mistakes I'm making, uh, the glorious discoveries that come across, you know, along the way, and, and, and sort of invite readers in and want to be webcomics guys in and show them what we're doing. And I think that was a smart move. Um, part of that is the monetization part. There is no really great stream of revenue out there yet for anybody who's just starting out. Uh, so at this point, it is a it is a money loss. I'm just paying Pete, and I'm paying the the right you know the artists, and then the colorists, and the production people I'm working with to do the comics. I'm not paying myself, and getting out there once a week with Insufferable, and then starting next month, John Rogers material launches. So that'll be two things a month on or two things a week on on Thrill Bent, and then by the end of the summer, we want to get up to something every day. Um, We've talked to advertisers, and we've got some things in the works there. We've talked to sponsors, and we've got some th some things in the works there. And as that comes to fruition and as that starts to firm up, uh, I'll talk about it all I can on the markwade.com blog because I think that's part of the transparency of the process. It is the Achilles heel of the system right now 
You can't go into business with a web comic and expect to be making giant revenue the next day uh, under the model that we're working. You know what's interesting? I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can paraphrase what you just said and you know repackage it for a little because I, I, I talked for 25 minutes <laughs> no no but I, I just want to highlight some things that you said in there that that really stuck out to me is you know i got friends who are artists who don't have any web presence at all and when i talk to them about like you know you do need stuff how come you're not sharing this with people and they're like yeah i just do it on the side uh and i say but you know it's really easy and they go well but then i got to come up with a corporate branding identity i got to get my my llc i got to get my corporate logo and i got to figure out a blogging strategy i got to figure out like uh you know how I'm gonna how exactly I'm gonna use Facebook? How I'm gonna use this and and how to? I need a, an intern to do my PR for me too. And I'm like, dude, that's not how yeah. web publishing works. You just dive in and you do it and you let it iterate. You because websites are supposed to iterate. We expect that of them. Yeah. And then you take that lack of readiness to say, well, how can I leverage this in my favor? Well, heck, you stepped forward and became a personal face. You became the Colonel Sanders of the organization, as it were. Right. But even more forthcoming well, about stuff rather than trying to hide behind LLC, INC, right? right? You know? I, I, I actually, uh, tying both those things together, I think that one of the things I remember as Thrill Belt launched, people were asking about navigation. And you went, oh, yeah. Like, and, we, and, and people could watch in real time as you went, yeah. oh, yeah, we should probably put that up. And like a little while later, the instructions were put up. And I think that it both, it, it deals with the immediacy it, rather than disposability. I'll go with immediacy of the sure. web. Plus, it also humanizes you. You know, it's like, hey, this here's this guy who, you know, we normally see his work, you know, end result, yeah, all all polished in a way that we're used to seeing. And it it says, hey, Mark's still learning too, and and sort of exactly. Yeah, I, I, and I'm fine with that. I'm I am, you know, Paul, as you know, I, I'm a big believer in transparency. I'm a big believer in 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 not hiding behind secrets and and you know processes and stuff i want especially in the web comics arena we're all learning what we're doing we're still trying to a lot of us are still trying to figure out just the language of what we're talking about and the pro, not not just the process and i see no reason why we can't figure out a way to work on that together because and this is also something i said at the harvey awards that it really excites me about this time in the medium that for the first time since comics were created in america we as creators have a chance now to be the ones to decide what the business model is going to be for the upcoming century. We as creators have the power to figure out how we're going to make this industry work. And we don't have, we no longer have to take our cues from, you know, giant money men or, you know, big fat publishers in their suits and in a big ivory tower chomping cigars. We get to figure it out ourselves. So the best way to do that is for us to talk to each other, learn from each other, and and come to the table with enough humility to be able to to work with each other. Yeah. I, I that reminds me of how many times I sat with other creators and said, "Why can't we get people to say listen to Kurt Busick about how we need to do marketing?" Yeah, you know, because there's so many creators with very solid backgrounds in 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 other aspects. Yeah, uh, that that are very knowledgeable and very intelligent. And yet you go, why? Why? This is a very simple thing that so and so just said. I I single out Kurt because he's constantly going, you know, saying stuff about say trade dress or something right. that you just go, oh, that would be really good. Why yeah. don't they do that? Um, and uh, and yeah, as you say, it's that's what's exciting. You're on the web. You're the one making the decisions. You're not running it past not only the visible. I think a lot of comic fans don't realize that once you get past the visible, the editors and the executive editors or the editor-in-chief or whatever, then there's the whole line, line of suits all up, the, the bean counters, the, you know, <laughs> there's more layers than people expect, and those are cut away. Well, so we got the immediacy, we got like the uh, the camaraderie that can come out of publishing on the web that you don't like i remember when i was first first going to conventions this would be oh my god almost 20 years ago uh oh is that all yeah i know for you guys it's like is that all like for me it's like oh i'm, I'm just dawning on me that I'm, I'm aging uh but but i remember like it's sometimes it's some shows and i'm not gonna say which ones but at some shows there was like a sense of competition i don't want to tell you how i did that 
You know, oh, mm. could you tell me how you did that? Oh, no, because then we're competing at this show. But, you know, it, 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 yes. it, oh, wow. times are changing, actually, for the most part. Like when you go to like an SPX or a MoCA or yeah. TCAF, you know, it's it's very different there. But but it used to be. Or, or the Twitter community or the. Yeah, you know, yeah, the, yeah. 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 Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing specifically with the comics on the site, because this is also interesting. So you've been blogging, as you said, yeah. and you talked about aspect ratios and how that's important. And you thought really hard about what aspect ratio you're going to land on with these comics. And, and then also. This is where I want to talk about the comic Luther. If people haven't gone to thrillbent.com and read Luther yet, you should. Because, um, okay, Mark, I'm sure you've heard of these motion comics that everybody's jawing about. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the devil's tool. Yeah. yeah that, that, that response makes me feel better. The, uh, yeah. the, 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 like, not quite the uh, Marvel 60s superhero uh, cartoons, yeah, but yeah. really close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to which, to which I've just said, like, that's it's a fine medium, just don't call it comics because it ain't comics because it breaks a rule of comics. And whenever, you know, th these new technologies come along and people get really excited and they say, hey, what, what could we do with comics with this? We could do a new thing with comics. We can put sound in it. We can put motion in it and whatever. And I go, yeah, but it's neat to experiment with comics, but don't throw out what makes it comics. If you've removed static juxtaposed images, it's not the medium anymore. It's something else. Call it something else, please. For the God's sake, we're stuck with this name that is not descriptive in the first place. You yeah. know, when, when I have when I have in-laws who say, what, are you a stand-up comedian? You make jokes? You're a comics artist, you know? Yeah. No. Every, every time you say you go to a comic con, people are like, oh, so you do stand-up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So we're stuck with that. So please, let's use proper nomenclature. That's all I'm saying. I don't hate the medium of motion comics. It's just don't call them comics. Anyway, uh, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I was just taking the bullet on that one. Uh, so Thank I, goodness you gave the right answer, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on on the Thrillbent website, you have a link to uh, I'm gonna, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name right. Ives Berg Bergerel. Oh, uh, Yves Bigerel, yeah, the Yves, French cartoonist. Yeah, Yves Bigerel. He has a link to uh, on his DeviantArt site a uh, his manifesto of, mo of of digital comics, and he does a yeah. lot of interesting things, which implies motion. But there's no motion. Nothing right. moves. It's just by using some different tricks of hey, you know, you can take this panel and you can add an element to it. And nothing moved. It's still comics. It's still static juxtaposed images, but it makes you feel like it's moving. Now, in Luther, there's a moment. Dan Mishkin, who I believe you are uh, friendly oh, yeah. with, uh, he, he alerted me to this. He's like, read Luther. You have to see this scene. He's like, a character opens their eyes. Yep. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you where it happens, but just brace yourself for it because it gives you the most delightful little thrill of, oh, it kind of surprised me. It startled me. It implied movement, but nothing actually moved in the panel. Exactly. So when I read that, I was like, oh, this is terrific. This is somebody playing with the digital landscape, but preserving what makes comics so awesome is the kinds of tricks that can happen through images being next to each other and what your mind does when you decode that, right? What are I, you going to say, Paul? I, well, I, actually, I, I believe I've heard Mark talk about this and several others, uh, about how, um, and Dan, I think, likes to talk about the, how the turn of the page yeah. allows the reader to control the flow of the story. Yeah. Uh, which is very different than a movie or television. And you've taken that one step further with uh, the stuff you're doing on Thrillbent, where there there are elements that you, you know, can bring up on the on the page as you know, it 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 again, it's that idea of comics controls the the the, the reader interacts with the flow of the story and kind of controls that. And I think that that's that's pretty brilliant to kind of incorporate the turn page on the screen. any individual screen yeah. uh, you know on any any set of images you know uh, there's several times where you have you you start with you see all four you know uh, panels that are supposed to be there but you only have the one image to begin with and then the others and i i thought Wow, that is taking something so essentially comics. Be before before the two blowhards actually let you talk, Mark, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do want to warn the this is an all ages show, and I do want to warn that Luther is while there's nothing there, there's some there's some intense visuals in there. Let's say walking. Yeah, there's, dead. Yeah, there's no bad language, but there's some intense visuals. There there are some reasonably if you're yeah if you're not comfortable with your kid watching The Walking Dead, then you may not be comfortable with them reading Luther. But, right. Yeah. Right. But anyway, people should read it to see what you did with that, uh, with these nice tricks. And it, it, it reminds me of what what I found out just before we started recording, or maybe we were already recording, I don't remember anymore, uh, with Joe Quesada's, that video of Joe Quesada demonstrating the Infinite Comics thing, which does a lot of the same kind of tricks with, here's a shot of Nova flying through space, and then all of a sudden an inset panel will appear, another inset panel will appear, and then the larger shot will change, the art will change inside of it with each successive flick of the finger right. on the screen. Um 
very interesting. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, McLeod was making first steps towards this with his his uh, Zot comic he did back in two thousand one, where he was playing with the Infinite Scroll to control the, the the reading experience, right? The pacing, but that's important, right? I mean, we can't throw that away just because it's a digital medium, right? No, I, that that's the yeah. most important thing to me. I and and it still has to feel like a comic. The moment you add sound, the moment you add voices, the moment you add motion, all of these things serve to take the control away from you of how you process the story, at what pace you absorb the information, at what pace you turn the pages or or absorb the information. And therefore, you're not reading anymore. You're just watching and it becomes a lot more passive experience. I mean, it, try reading you know it, try reading a comic with somebody sometime and you're sharing a comic and you're reading you're not reading at the same speed generally and so you have one person has to wait for the other person to catch up and then you both turn the page together that's that's a clue to how intimate the relationship is between you and the page when you're reading um, this is that's the most important thing about digital storytelling is that it still feel like a comic that it's about page turns it's about yeah, there's bells and whistles and interesting sort of visual gimmicks that you can do only in digital, but it still feels like a comic. Right. One of the things I, I do a lot of uh, classes for kids and adults, and one of the things I try to explain to adults is they're really wrestling with this kind of, like, especially when I show, like, really um, advanced paneling compositions. Like, when you look at Ernie Cologne's work, right? Ernie Cologne yeah. really plays with the page, or Walt Simonson really plays with the page uh, and gets you to move your eye in all sorts of different directions as a pacing technique as well. And... Um, I say to them that, uh, oh, where was I going with this? Uh, the, 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 there's the, the, in a comic, there's this immediacy that you can zig and zag without losing the experience of being in the story. Yeah. Whereas if you're watching a film, you have to hit rewind. What did that guy say? I rewind and then I watch it again. Whereas in a comic, it's like your eye could just go back there and then zig back to where you were. And there's less of a sense of removing yourself from the story and to do that. In, instant replay without without it being jarring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's an unjarring instant replay. That's a good way to put it. And so I think that that's another thing that needs to be preserved. So, you know, when people say like, well, what if you just do one panel per screen, one panel per screen, you just flick, flick, flick. I'm like, well, it's it's... It's still a comic in the sense that it's sequential images, but you lose something really magical when you put two images together and your your brain starts doing weird stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I, uh, Bijerel did something really interesting that we're going to adopt, and we've already adopted in Insufferable, which is the idea of doing an image on the left, and then on the page swipe, you, you keep that image on the left, but then an image on the right to juxtapose. And then on the next page turn, an image drops in between the two that changes the meaning of everything on the page. Mm. And it, it, it's, you know, an unexpected thing where it's like a hand reaching out between two characters or something that that creates a relationship between the two images you've already seen or or changes the relationship between the two images you've seen. I know it's man. I still feel like we're blind men, you know, trying to describe an elephant I, you know, <laughs> we're doing we're just verbally without the benefit of pictures, but if you, but the beauty of thrillbent.com is that it is all free for viewing. I'm not trying to plug. I just want to, this seemed like a good time to say, you know, if you're not familiar with the stuff, thrillbent.com, uh, don't just take our word for it. Go take a look. It's free for the viewing and take a look at the chapters up there. Uh, it costs you nothing and you'll get a better sense maybe of, of what we're talking about in the visual realm. If you're still a little confused about what we're saying. Question, uh, and this is more of a technical thing. I'm just curious, and maybe there's a little philosophy behind this, I hope. Uh, is is there a reason that you chose to not do an app and just do it as a website that works just as good on the iPad as it does on the desktop? Was there a philosophical th decision behind that, or was it pure, you know, deadly economy? No, there's no, actually, there's, we are working on apps that are more branded specifically to each d different title. That seems to be the one, the way that might be working better for us as opposed to a separate say thrill bent app because uh, honestly there's nothing given the sophistication of mobile devices now there's really nothing you can do on an app that you can't just do on the web okay. when it comes to the model that we've set up but that said that becomes also part of the monetization of it all like you know in a couple of months we'll launch an insufferable app that for 99 cents or whatever we end up charging for it and it will be cheap you know, you get to download that material with you and walk around with it all you want. There'll be bonus content and, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Eli Nyberger's in the chat. Uh, Eulogtrichus on the Twitters and on the web, and he he's, says it here, and he said it many times before, and I, I think this is the right way to look at it, is only make apps when it can't be done on the web. 
Yeah. Uh, right. And and so that was another thing that when I was visiting the site, I was pleasantly surprised that like while I'm looking at it on my laptop, I wonder what it looks like on the iPhone. Hey, it works just fine on the iPhone. I'm gonna look at it on the iPad. It looks great on the iPad, and I don't you... have to buy it or download a, spe- a separate thing. No, you can thank Lori Matsumoto for that. Lori Matsumoto and and our web crew. Uh, Lori's the manager of the of the site and does the heavy lifting, and you know she's the one who's been laboring to make sure that all of that works across platforms. And so that was very important to us. I mean, I, really important to us that it's we chose the four to three ratio for two reasons. One is that if we do go to print with some of this material down the road, it just works better because you take two four four to three ratio screens, you stack one on top of each other, and you've got a standard comics page. Uh, obviously, looking at what we've done since then with some of the digital, there's going to have to be some extra production work to preserve some of the effects that we've come across. But still, that's one of the reasons. The other one is that 4 to 3 just universally works best across iPhones, Android devices, I- iPads, and your computer screen. doesn't work as well with the Kindle Fire because the Kindle Fire is, which I like, the, but the Kindle Fire is some sort of weird, like, I don't know, 6 to 1 ratio. It's something, it's some absurdly incredibly wide and really shallow thing um so it's there is no perfect there's no perfect uh ratio for all devices so four to three seem to be the the most common in the we we don't have the luxury of doing the same level of adaptive technology that say esquire or wired magazine or some of the better uh digital magazines for the ipad do where you know you turn the screen in a different orientation and the and the copy lays out to fit that orientation because comics aren't magazines you get you can do that with us we can do that with entertainment weekly because you've got a photograph and a main article and a sidebar and then you turn the page sideways on your iPad and everything flows into place and you're still looking at the information but it's it's you know it's arranged differently on the page you don't have that option with comics because comics is all about the juxtaposition of the copy and the art and unless you're willing to pay your artist to do a layout twice for both, you know, for both devices, it's not the same. Yeah, and then you're doubling your your production costs on that. And yeah, you're talking about responsive design, which is a hot topic right now on the web. Right, is designing websites that can that just adapt to whatever device they're being displayed on. Yeah, you're right, and that is one of one of the shortcomings of comics is that it's mo- a lot more difficult for us to do that. But right. hey, check this out. Although, this, although I will say the site itself, I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that the site itself is one of the first ones to do adaptive technology in in that comics in the comics realm like that. This you know the both Mark Wade and the Thrillbent.com site themselves when you look into the blogging the you know all the other stuff that's not comics that is adaptive technology and eli nyberg is saying in the chat that uh the u- user experience on thrillbent is already better than most apps so that that's high Great. praise that's a man who knows the web so uh, excellent so yeah so you guys did good there Lori's... inspiring words from a man who knows the web <laughs> and, and and hats off to Lori for that and also yep. i just want to give Lori a shout out because she said some very nice things about this show uh when she contacted me so th- th- it's 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 nice to actually get a pat in the back for what you do every once in a while so thanks Lori. Uh, but okay, so um, let's talk about some of the titles on there. So we we talked about all these different things. We talked about the the affordances. We talked about the different kinds of thinking that you had to do in order to develop this project. Uh, we've got Luther on there, which we talked about, which is a, a zombie apocalypse story, a short story where uh, somebody learns about uh, you know making assumptions about people uh, yeah. in, in in a very uh, frightening yet touching way. <laughs> <laughs> But then you also have the new one that's updating right now is Insufferable. I and mean, you mentioned it earlier. I'm wondering if we could just talk about that for a few seconds. This is your new one, your new project. Yeah, exactly. And, and a, contrary a, to popular belief. Yeah. You were going to say? Oh, I was Paul? saying contrary to popular belief, it is not a biocomic about Mark. No, it is not, exactly. It's, uh, I've never heard that one before, Pete. Um, <laughs> that's it, how all Paul's jokes go. <laughs> the No, Peter Krauss and I, who created you know, uh, Irredeemable, for, for Boom, uh, we went off and created Insufferable for this because uh, I love working with Pete. Insufferable is basically, I, 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 with Thrill Bent, we want to very quickly try to stray away from standard capes and tights superhero material and move into other genres. But I, I played it a little close to the vest with this one because I'm, you know, I'm still known as more as a superhero guy. So I wanted to put my best foot forward here. And so Insufferable is a caped adventure series, but it has it's a dramedy, if you will. It's about what happens when your costume sidekick turns, uh, you know, grows up to be a jerk, grows up to be a, a self-aggrandizing, egotistical uh, guy who completely forget forgets where he came from, uh, and and it's all about him. Um, 
I call it the Grant Morris and Mark Millar story. Wait, did I oh. say that? Line <laughs> on the air? Like, oh. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Uh, we'll get a, a couple extra links, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> no, Mark Millar is a nice man. It just, it's, I'm, I, you, you take little bits of life and then you, you expand upon them. Um, Embellish, you if you will. Yeah. Uh, but that said, that's, or, or, you know, Mar I was going to say Martin and Lewis as well, but that really dates us. So uh, those sort of interesting partnerships where, you know, there's been a falling out, those, those interest me. So that, that, what was envisioned is actually a more satirical comic take on, on that material. Once I get into it, I didn't want to make these characters cartoons. And also I wasn't drawing from any one specific set of people. I was just were aggregating a lot of different influences and they became more interesting and more fleshed out as they became a little more serious. So there are some really comic moments in it, but there's some heart to it as well. Now we've got three minutes before we kick into book recommendations. Uh, and I wanted to ask the update schedule for this thing, cause you've been blogging about that as well. Uh, some yep. very interesting thoughts about, you know, weighing what your options are and man, Faith Aaron Hicks, uh, friends with boys, uh, published by first second, Faith Aaron Hicks on the Twitters. She was recently asking the question on Twitter, like, well, with a long form sto uh, comic story, uh, and actually there's a long form comic uh, hashtag on Twitter where there's some discussion about this. I think it's uh, LF. Oh, man, I'm going to have to look it up and post it later uh, right. in, into the show notes. But anyway, so we, there's more people talking about this. But mm -hmm. it's like, do you post every day or do you post a big chunk of once a week? This is a tough thing to wrestle with. Is is uh, you're talking about a publication schedule, right? And Oh, yeah. This is the hardest writing I've ever done in my entire life because it's not just a matter of making sure I hit those weekly deadlines. We, launch, we, we put every new installment of Insufferable up every Wednesday at noon Eastern Standard Time, 9 Pacific. And they are... The, the trick is to do short bursts of eight to 10 to 12 screens worth of material each week uh, that convey a story that where there's a conflict and a resolution and then some sort of cliffhanger at the end that brings you back to next week. Uh, this is much easier said than done in that short a space. But so far, so good. Yeah, it's it. this is something where I, I serialized a comic on the Internet years ago where I it wasn't a gag story, right? So, yeah. and, and it wasn't something where every, and I did a page a week, so that's all I could manage with a day job and freelance yeah. illustration mm -hmm. work. And so it's like, well, I can't have a, what's that at the end of every page? It would be brutal to right. read it as a collection. So the, the trick was, is like, how can I design the pages to either A, have that kind of what happens next, or B, have some kind of satisfactory kind of wholeness to it where, yeah. okay, I feel like I got something today. There was content here. Or C, is get them to wonder, boy, I wonder where this is ultimately going. It, and yeah. to design a 200-page story like that, man, that is a whole different way of thinking about comics, isn't it? Oh, it's a totally different way of thinking about comics. It's, it's, uh, and yet, it's a very old way of thinking about comics because what I'm pointing my other writers and other younger writers to is look at Terry and the Pirates. Look at Prince Valiant. Look at yeah. the great comic strips of the, the Sunday strips of the 1930s and 40s. I don't want you to go for that in terms of style. I, I think that a lot of that material is dated but the feeling of it, the feeling of telling, uh, you know, a series of events with significance in small chunks, there's an art and a craft to that. And, and we could do a lot worse than to look back and let some of that influence what we're doing today. I, I think of Why the Last Man, which I'm sure we've all read, right? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and every chapter ends with, ah, I guess we finally solved the whole issue of why there's only one man left on Earth. No, we didn't. Yeah. What's that? It's something else. Wait till yeah. next month. <laughs> and when you read it as a collection, it's like, whoa, he did this a lot. You know, yeah. he did that every issue. And so, you know, it, I, I, I like what you said there about how it's not about don't just copy it wholesale. Look at, think about it philosophically, what they're trying to achieve there and how can you invent something to lead the reader along, yeah. right? And people are saying in the chat, this is, we're talking about episodic fiction here, right? Yeah. So, um, okay, well, it's time uh, to start talking. Well, go I'm, ahead. Just I'm sorry. Before, just before you boot me out, I'm, I'm going to do something uncharacteristic. I'm going to be kind to a guest. And I, I'm going to make a recommendation, which is Mark is currently working on the Daredevil book at Marvel. And it is some of the most fun superhero comics that anybody has read in a long time. Not that I don't, and, and Insufferable is also top-notch stuff, and people should avail themselves of that. <laughs> but as far as a book recommendation, seek out uh, seek out uh, Daredevil, because Mark's uh, just knocking it out of the park. So. Uh, he, he, well, and, and, and you're not used to hearing me say something sincere, but there you go, Mark. 
<laughs> no, I'm, I don't. I think there is there is the connection. Down? Am I going through a tunnel? I don't understand. <laughs> I did, I get it, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, Mark has a history of really understanding how to get at a character and flesh that out and make them into likable or interesting people, right? Uh-huh. So yeah. Uh, any, which, any... which is ironic given how unlikable I personally am, but still. I, you'll <laughs> notice I did not say that. I let you yeah. say it. Well, just because you understand likable people doesn't make you likable, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sociopaths understand human emotion. They just don't feel it. <laughs> there we go. So, okay, well, I wanted to give us a chance to do some book recommendations, and then I'm going to boot Paul out and mm-hmm. bring Eli in. So, did Good you talking bring... to you, Mark. No, well, Great I, talking I, just, no I, I just made mine. I, oh, okay. So that was mine. it. So the Daredevil books yep. uh, by by Mark Wade. If if you can okay. f- you go the, to your the retailer, Mark Wade's. the Mark Wades, <laughs> and and uh, and go to your retailer. And if they don't have it, say what what the heck is wrong with you? Why don't you have this book? Uh, yeah. And then you can point them at comicsforgreat slash cag five six to hear our discussion on the topic uh, to justify why Mark's book should be in comic stores. So yeah. here comes Eli Nyberger of the Ann Arbor District Library, Ulotricus on the Twitter. Did I say that right this time? Yes, you did. Thank Why's God. Yes, you done. <laughs> Jersey. <Yeah. laughs> so, okay, so yeah. So um, w- do you want me to go first? Or do you want to go first? Why don't you go first? Okay, so I'm going to go first the book recommendations this week. And Mark, I'm going to give you a chance to think of any, if you have any besides uh, your or insufferable to talk about sure. this time. Uh, but I have in my hands, speaking of web comics and speaking of uh, you know building material around the free bits, uh, I became a fan of this comic called Gray Is by Dee Jusan. And uh, she is a cartoonist out of uh, Jordan who is doing a shoujo manga, which is gorgeous. It is absolutely beautiful. Let's see if I can find some of the cards in here that get included. Uh, just really thoughtful, pensive, sweet. Uh, I'm trying to think of a word besides bromance for like a story about two guys who really care about each other deeply. Um, but uh, it's it's also it's just it's it's shoujo shoujo manga for those who like it in in the finest tradition of shoujo manga. It's it's it, it takes its time. It's paced very well, uh, and it's illustrated gorgeously. So um, she is at grayismanga.com where you can read the comic and then when I read the comic I said this is awesome I adore it and so you know what I did I bought the comic as soon as it was in print the moment she said hey it's in print would you like one I said yes please I'll take uh, I'll take two you know well I only bought one but I, I, I should have bought two so I could give one to some friends or to some of my teenage students but anyway uh, it's it's awesome to see that uh, you know non uh, Japanese artists can create really really stunning manga and and I, I'm thinking of um, it, her handle is Deb Aoki on Twitter, D E B A O K I. She was recently posting uh, some discussion about the difference between fake manga and real manga in the eyes of fans, and uh, I think it's it's a little troubling that 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 distinction still is there because it's all just comics after all, and there's all kinds of different styles. Manga doesn't mean one thing, but anyway, that's another episode for another time. I'll get Casey Van Heys on for that. So Eli, how's it going, Jersey? Good, good, good. This was a fun episode. Yeah, this is great. And hi, Mark. How's it going? Good, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for for being on Jersey Show today. Because this is uh, what you're doing is really cool. It's fantastic to see in the right direction. As someone who doesn't really have a dog in this fight personally, yeah. uh, I think that what you're doing is unbelievably forward looking and progressive for this business. And right. you know, it reminds me is hearing the tales of the uh, pushback you've run into, which I hadn't previously heard <laughs> to today. Um, yeah. It reminds me of the Upton Sinclair quote, which is that it is. I think he said, it is difficult to convince a man of something. No, it is difficult for a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. Uh. <laughs> that's an excellent quote, and that's very, very true. I Honestly, a big part of the pushback from retailers, I understand fully. They're working on very thin margins. The economics of scale are not working to their advantage, and it's a very frightening time. now. I don't think we'd be having the same pushback 10 years ago in a in a healthier economic environment, I think that all these things conspire to make, uh, you know, to help sort of accentuate this culture of fear, uh, and 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 trepidation about the future. And I and I get that. And and so I'm a lot more compassionate about their position than I think they believe I am. I sure. I, I do feel for them. I understand where that fear comes from. But we're smart guys. I mean, we'll yeah. you know we're really smart guys. Well, not just me. I'm I'm the idiot in the room. But <laughs> the but I surround myself with smart guys, and we'll figure it out. Well, and and the the notion that business models are eternal, 
is kind of a problematic one. Yes, <laughs> I it. think there's there's really no evi- well, there's one business model I can think of that's eternal, but it's not appropriate yeah. for this show. <laughs> um, right. You know, everything else and digital know? hasn't replaced that yet. <laughs> yeah, digital, video. not yet. Not that's yet. right. <laughs> Japan's working on that. I saw I saw the video of that butt that you can. That you, anyway, yes, uh, Jersey's <laughs> watching Japanese robot butt videos to prepare for his <laughs> earmuffs. Earmuff. I'm holding my iPad, or else I would have my hands to my ear. Uh, but but another thing that I like that you said, Mark, is that uh, it's. I think you posted this in your blog. Is that look, we're just figuring out these new affordances and new ways to approach comics, and it's going to be the next generation of kids who are going to take what we did. Our our sort of a myopic and yeah. limited view of what can be done with this, and they're going to invent the next big thing. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, I, I think that both you guys said really, really smart things on that in that regard. Well, I think what's what's most exciting about Thrillbent is that it, it doesn't view print versus digital as a zero sum game because right. it really isn't. Because one of those things is finite and scarce, and the other is infinite and and you know unending. Yeah. And I, I think that you know all media are going to have a uh, a continuum between digital and physical materials. And I think was really, to me, looking at where publishing is right now, especially genre fiction publishing, which is what a lot of libraries are freaking out about. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, they believe that these business models are going to continue the way that they always have been. But in reality, the no, you know bits don't have value. And I know I'm talking about this all the time on the show, but well, bits don't have economic value. Right. And... Things have economic value, and the internet didn't change that law, you right. know. And so I think what's what's so great about Thrillbent is seeing, and I know that this is what freaks people out the most because, you know, all of the worries about price points. You know, whenever you see a publisher saying, "Oh, you can't do that. You're going to kill our price point," all that kind of stuff. What they say, what there's the subtext there is, we're in a bubble and we know it. Don't yep. pop it, <laughs> asshole. You know. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. Yeah. So when you got a pricing bubble like this, and it's it's really free is the right price point for bits because there's just not transaction cost unless you're attempting to overlay multiple restrictive technologies on it. So right. And I tell you another reason why free is the right price point too is that you know sure enough, and I'm not offended by this. I'm actually thrilled by this that the next day, you know, we put up an installment up on Wednesday. The next day, it's up on the torrent sites. It's been downloaded, converted to a CBR file, and up on torrent sites. Right. I, it's great. You know what? I that their audience is out there that's that hungry for it. That's terrific. The, what I want, what I'm doing in the next couple of weeks is rather than fight that, which is ridiculous. You'll never stop that out. Is just I'll create those files for you. Yep. Yep. And that way, I'm able to put a bumper screen at the end that says, "Hey, if you like this, right? You know, come back to Thrillbent.com for more free comics." And then I take as much, then then I make it work for me. Well, and as really, yeah, and what we call seeding now is the closest to what we call publishing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. seeding is publishing, so... Well, Paulo Coelho, story. that's that famous story of him taking The Alchemist and in, in, intentionally putting it on the torrents behind his publisher's right. backs, and then there was a boom in sales because of that. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then people said to me, like, oh, don't put your art on <clears throat> Tumblr because people steal it and then remove attribution, And I, to which I said, I hope I make something cool enough that somebody right. wants to steal it. Yeah. That's a good thing, because the, the, the only other place they can get more of that stuff is here from this kid. Look, yeah. so, we, you, know, you know who's not having this conversation? Poets. They're not, right. they're not they're not freaking out about all the torrenting of all the poetry out there. It's just right. it's <laughs> the fact that the fact that we have we're working in a medium that people are so hungry for on an international basis that they will grab it and share it and whether yeah. we're leaving the the morality and the ethics of the of that equation off the table for a second and just concentrating on the fact that how cool is it as a, a creative artist to realize that there is that much of a hunger for what you do. That has value. Yeah. Yeah. It yep. is not dollar and cents value in the sense that I can't go to Ralph's and buy my kids food with it, but it's value. And how do we turn that into uh, you know a, a, a value that that we can do something with as creative right. people. This is why people hate you Marcus because you're asking us to think really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm asking you to think outside the, the, the box of what, you know, the, the big media corporations have tried to convince you are the ways of thinking. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of the philosophy about all of this stuff, all the philosophy about torrenting, all the philosophy about quote unquote piracing, pirating, uh, piracy, all the philosophy about the way the economic model should work, all of those 
philosophies have been honed and driven down our throats by Sony and by MGM and by Paramount and by the, you know, and by Time Warner and by the big media corporations who have everything to lose if we don't play their way. I'm not trying to, I don't, I'm not trying to make this like I'm some, some new wage, new wave philosopher with a tinfoil hat. <laughs> I'm not trying to make it a conspiracy against the man, but you do consider, consider where that message comes from. And also then on the flip side, consider how many people, a lot, how many people have already approached us in the last two weeks of Thrill Bent to say, we understand what you're doing is free. We appreciate this. How can we pay for it? Because we want to support what you're doing. Is there some way we can contribute? Now, that is anecdotal. Now, there are not enough of those people yet out there proven to be able to fund this from the get-go. But the fact that there are people out there who are spontaneously asking us about this, that's terrific. That's, that goes to what I'm saying, that there is an audience out there for what you want to do. And they'll support you. And that, that's a beautiful segue into the stuff that I wanted to show today for my recommendations. Okay, cool. So uh, let me... Uh, I just thought you were hailing a cab. What you <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, yeah, you can see that. They can't see that uh, I'm off camera officially. Ah, so okay. uh, let me see if I got my mouse control. Okay, here we go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so talking about how to get people to pay things that are already free, we got a couple of really good examples for this here. Um, one is uh, one of my favorite. Uh, he's kind of in between an editorial cartoonist, and you know he's he's in the alt weeklies, things like this. This is Ruben Balling, who stripped uh, Tom the Dancing Bug. Uh, you know, I remember reading Tom the Dancing Bug like in the early days of Salon, when Salon was flat HTML files. You know, like <laughs> 1999 sort of <laughs> proto Urweb when we were all wearing our loincloths and you know using Mosaic and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Anyway. Um, so he does what are you know really kind of political comics for the most part, and he's been looking at what the web comic people have done because he's not really a web comic artist because uh, you know he is in the newspaper business really. He's he's you know he's got his stuff on the web on websites, but it's also in alt weeklies and things like that. So he launched this past week a project called the Inner Hive, and what you get for the Inner Hive, and let me move my window back over here, is. First of all, uh, he one of his ongoing jokes is that we are all brains and beakers, uh, you know, and there's no general proof of any of reality actually existing. So he starts off, dear brains and beakers, today I'm starting a new phase of my little weekly comic strip. And basically what he's offering is for $9.99, you get six months of an email subscription to his strip, and he emails it to you the day before it's published. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. just got the first one yesterday. Now, not only is it just kind of exciting to be in the secret, the secret Ruben Balling fan club That's and it. get that content that I would have had for free the next day, one day early. I'm in mm -hmm. his secret club. Um, he also included other strips that he had done in the past that are related to the strip that he was sending, his new strip. And he included a beautiful piece of original Dennis the Menace comic that had influenced his choices that he was Super making. Super cool. So I got this one email in my inbox, and it's got like four strips in it, and I was like, this is fantastic. And then the magical thing happened is I clicked reply. I said, this is so great. Thanks for doing it. And he replied back, you know, yep. and that this came for, and basically what, uh, what I'm doing is, you know, nine ninety nine for six months, he'll send me an email once a week. Yep. You know, this yep. is not an elaborate, uh, an elaborate distribution system. No, and you will follow his work for the next few years now, won't you? Yep. He has earned your loyalty. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and uh, and you know, and it's an outstanding value, and it's something where right away, what I said to him in my email is like, I would pay twice this right now for this, yeah. for nothing else, even if you still sold it at nine ninety nine, and it's like it's the super inner hive yep. for nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. What do you get? It's exactly the same thing as the inner hive plus <laughs> it's super. <laughs> you know, I would totally double down well, on this. And and this stuff what you're talking about is very very powerful and I and I can't understate or underscore this enough is that Ryan Estrada of ryanestrada.com who's uh, he's got a million followers on Google Plus now good for him. And uh, he started this thing where he said, I'm going to make a secret circle where I'm just going to post secret stuff that only people in the secret circle get to see. Absolutely free. And I signed up, I, you know, I, and I, I get my first little post, and it says, secret circle, secret post in bold letters. And I, you know, my lizard brain fell victim to that, that tribal mentality of like, the hair stand up. I'm like, oh, this is something only for me, right? That's powerful stuff. It's not a community until someone's excluded. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, Ryan Estrada is another guy to watch. He does all this stuff really brilliantly. But uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, awesome, awesome insight. So there. let me show another example here. Yeah. Uh, let me get Matt to switch back over and hand me back the mouse. Thank you. And uh, so another one that I've been looking at is uh, Scary Go Round, which is John Allison, who is a, a, a hugely unappreciated comic artist in the U.S. He's got a good fan following from his old strip, Bobbins, but he has this new strip, Bad Machinery, and you know he moved from writing about British hipsters to writing about British school children, and it's, it's, a, it's a tough group for his webcomic reading audience. So one thing he offered now is his new subscription, and he says right here, you can see, this is an experiment. I have no idea if this will work. He says, for nearly 10 years, I've supported myself by making merchandise. And this is something I heard uh, MC Frontalot said this week to Jeffrey Rowland on Twitter. He said, we're in the t-shirt business. We just make comics to drive traffic to our t-shirt sites. Uh -huh. you know? And it's like, the t-shirts are how we fund our music and our comics. But mm -hmm. we're really... We're in the uh, the apparel business, yeah, you know, and yeah. I think that there's, <laughs> well, those are things they have value. So here you can see he has his standard plan is three dollars a year, you receive nothing. His bronze <laughs> plan is ten dollars a year, you receive nothing, etc. Twenty five dollars receive nothing, fifty dollars receive nothing. Platinum plan. Well, when I saw this, I was like, I'm going for the gold plan <laughs> right here. I'm going to put my money down because I love this artist. I want to support him. Um, I am. I worry when I see him tweet about how freaked out he is about his personal finances. You yeah. know, so I want to make this happen for him. That so, is you know. awesome. Standard bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, and every one of those, every year you pay a subscription to receive nothing but his gratitude. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. That is great. And you know, the funny thing is, this isn't new. This yeah. is patronage. This right. is yes, centuries exactly. old. Centuries old. So, okay, cool. Well, and I got one more here. Uh, that'll let me be in the show notes. Switch everybody. back over and. Okay, so the third one is Skin Horse. And this is, you know, of course, all the comics people, all the media people, everybody is watching Kickstarter very closely right now. Skin Horse is a comic by Shane and Garrity and uh, Jeff, I forget his last name, but they're a couple. Um, they're adorable. Uh, her old comic was Narbonic. It was a fairly popular webcomic and sort of the first wave of webcomics. And then it ended, and then she was releasing it as director's cut stuff. Well, now she's got Skin Horse. And what I like about this, and I'm just going to click through to it real quick, not sure if we have audio or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, Jersey, we're, already, we're always talking on the show about how, how some artists feel that they can't be the sort of out front type of person yeah. that you feel like you need to be to have success on Kickstarter. Yeah. What I love about this, and this is, you can see, this is already with 14 days to go, 300% overfunded. Um, there's you there's no pictures of them in this. There's no voice, there's no video. They did not they said they showed drawings of themselves and they showed clips of the work. Their Kickstarter video does not involve them getting in front of the camera. Yeah. Not that they can't or not that they shouldn't, but But if you're not comfortable with sitting in front of a camera, to. you don't have to. Yes. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, it's funny for people saying, I'm not comfortable being on. Well, this is the web. You don't have to be on. You know, <laughs> you're just it's it's a different way of uh of of putting yourself out there and you know skin horse is hilarious it's very tightly written uh has super huge long story arcs and big payoffs for long-standing jokes and i love this comic and i think you know clearly here this is again something that is already free on the web and this is just to fund the production of the book and, you know and this money is going to pay for all the copies only some of which are going to go to the people that backed it you know this is also how she's getting their inventory to do con season yeah. You know, and it's just it's a very different business model because instead of asking a publisher to speculate on whether or not your book will be successful, you're asking your fans to just fund it. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's successful. Well, it's already successful before you go to print. Yeah. You know, and it's like, man, if if only things that were already successful, well, it's kind of like that's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> they only want to send it to print if it's already going to be successful because it's such a risky business. So yeah. I think, you know, Kickstarter is just starting and I think that uh, you know, obviously Kickstarter, I don't think, is going to be the major dominant form of this kind of thing in 15 years. You know, there'll be all of the Kickstarter clones and Kickstarter reactions and Kickstarter spinoffs. Um, I think I saw someone who wanted to, who had a Kickstarter project to replace Kickstarter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's chutzpah. I like that. Um, but, you know, I think it's just, it's a really good example of the ways that you can, uh, you know, generate revenue without selling access to ones and zeros. Because it's just, and this is my drumbeat, in this century, nobody's going to get rich restricting access to ones and zeros. Right. You know? 
Right. Okay. Well, awesome. Those were all really awesome recommendations, both for reading and also just for consideration based on the larger points today. Uh, thanks, Eli. Gosh, You're uh, welcome. Mark, do you have anything that you wanted to throw out a, a, a recommendation for before we close? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, first off, uh, Skin Horse, I gave them a quote because I like their work an awful lot. I mean, I really like what the, that book is about. Um, there's other web stuff that I've been paying attention to that I really like. There's a, a book called Power Play, which actually does a very nice job of using the digital tools that we've been talking about. Still feels like a comic, but they're using infinite scrolling in some panels. They're using that sort of pop-up technique uh, that really smart. Uh, Alex DeCampi has done a, a web comic called Valentine, which sort of pioneered a lot of these techniques, which I really enjoy a lot. Uh, those are the ones that come immediately to mind. There's I, I mentioned Brian Clevenger's Atomic Robo earlier as a guy who gets it. Uh, and again, all the blind ferret guys with their with Jinx and Sue in particular and Gutters and and their books their, or their, their digital comics, they're doing it right. Um, I, I there's if you'd asked me six months ago, my list of recommendations would have been more cohesive and tight. But now that I've sort of been diving around in the web comics world like a porpoise for the past <laughs> six months every day. I'm overwhelmed by the amount of good material there is out there. And the great thing about that is while the signal to noise ratio is still huge on the web, sure. the web comics community itself is so tight and so well organized in its, in its own way that the, they find the good stuff for you and it rises to the top. There's still there's no sense of, of competition there. There is that sense of everybody still wanting to, to show you something new that somebody else has done. So, you know, it's not like well, it's not it's not. Your odds of of being discovered as a good web cartoonist are not as steep as they are in some other media because you've already got this community of like minded guys who are eager for more. Yeah, and I think that that's exactly right because it's. Uh, I think web comics understands that they're not in a zero sum game. Right. Whereas you know in the, in the print business, you really view there are so many dollars that this country spends on print comics. And if, it's I, just if, I how it's one thing, if I can do one thing to change the comics medium tomorrow, I would fire every executive at a major comics publisher and replace them with web comic publishers. Yep. Oh, did everybody heard that internet? <laughs> did you hear that? Okay, so we're gonna organize. We're gonna get behind Mr. Wade, and we're gonna put him in charge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. Anyway, thank you. Thank you guys so much for this, this awesome, awesome conversation. Um, I want to do a quick plug for some uh, events going on this summer. Kids Read Comics is upon us yep. at the Ann Arbor District Library. Right around the corner. It is right around the corner, and it's uh, July 7th and 8th, and actually the 6th if you count the kickoff event Friday night. So Friday the 6th, Saturday the 7th, and Sunday the 8th. Oh my gosh, I'm working on the programming list right now. We've already got some amazing stuff coming up uh, at KRC. We got uh, Marina Telgemeier is going to be here. Dave Roman's going to be here. Jay Torres, uh, Ruth McDally Barshaw, uh, and then a ton of different cartoons from all over the country coming out to uh, converge on the third floor at the Ann Arbor District Library. To uh, oh, we lost Mark. Well, that's okay. We'll give him a plug at the end. Uh, he was on an iPad. I'm surprised yeah. that that was working as well as it was. But uh, anyway, so that's that's at kidsreadcomics.org and comics.aedl.com. And then also, I am going to be at the uh, American Library Association Conference annual event in Anaheim, California, uh, June 21st through 26th. I'm going to be in the Graphicon Artist Alley area. Uh, you can just look for the awesome Graphicon logo. It was designed by Dave Roman of yaytime.com. And, I mean, you look at this guest list. Chris Russo, Matt Dimbicki, Faith Aaron Hicks, Raina Telgemeier, Dave Roman, Gene Luen Yang, Derek Kirk Kim, uh, you know, what, what the, Dan Santat, what the heck am I doing there? You know, I'm going to be the odd man you're out. You're kicking ass there is what you're doing, <laughs> Jersey. <laughs> but anyway, so you can find me there. That's, I'm gonna, so I'm going to be in uh, California in the last week of June. So anybody who's listening from that neck of the woods, if you want to come out and say hi to me, that would be super cool. Okay, so this episode will be uh, available at comicsagreat.com slash CAG56 and at comics.aadl.org. We will be live in two weeks at comics.agreat.tv. I want to thank Paul Story of storyville.com and Storyville on, on the Twitters for uh, joining us uh, today, and then also Mark Wade of thrillbent.com. Uh, we said that you were all a bunch of times in the show. I'm sure you guys remember it by now. Yes, it will be in the show notes if you don't. And then Eli Nyberger, uh, Associate Director of IT and Production, Production? at the Ann Arbor District Library, Ulotricus on the Twitters, and ulo.trico.us on the web. Uh, and check them out on the last episode if you haven't heard, to it, heard it yet. That was a really good one. We got some really positive responses out of it, so thanks for that right. too, Eli. Okay, so we will see you guys next time. Until then, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.